Hello, I'm James Jacobson in Hawaii. And I'm Pamela Lawrence in San Francisco. And I'm Caroline Winter in Adelaide. Welcome to Dog Edition, the first show designed for you to listen to while you walk your dogs. Today, we have a conversation with best-selling author Dean Koontz. I got to sit down with him last week for an extended conversation, and we're going to hear some of that on today's episode of Dog Edition. And we're also going to meet some very special dogs training to become the first line of defence in sniffing out COVID-19. Ooh, no more of the swabs up the nose. I like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and as always, stop by the hydrant with us at the end of the show for a rundown on some of the doggy headlines that captured our attention this week. So if you love dogs as much as we do, pause what you're doing, leash up your pup, and let's take a walk. We've got a lot to talk about on today's episode of Dog Edition. Hey, Pepper, want to go for a walk? A conversation with international best-selling author Dean Koontz can go in any number of directions, considering his long and decorated career. You might ask about his more than 105 novels or his many novellas and collections of short stories. After all, Over 500 million copies of his work have been sold, and his career has spanned six decades. Here at Dog Podcast Network, we wanted to know about the many times dogs have shown up in this author's incredible body of work, and why. I've written a lot about dogs. I started writing about dogs before I had one. The idea to write about dogs wasn't born out of childhood experience. Dean had limited exposure to dogs growing up. In fact, he recalls a particularly negative experience with a family dog. We had two dogs for very brief periods when I was a child, but we were uh, a very poor family and it was country and the dog wasn't in the house. And in the one case, the dog didn't last more than a week because its name was Tiny. And Tiny weighed 120 pounds when we got him. And... I was out playing with Tiny and he wrapped his chain around my neck and I was about five or six and that dog was strangling me and didn't know it. My mother looked out a window and saw it and came running out and got me out of the chain. I had link marks around my neck for a while. She insisted, Tiny is gone. So Tiny was gone. That incident did not diminish his fascination with dogs. He says he's always admired dogs, but he didn't have one in his life when he was writing his 1987 suspense novel, Watchers. And this idea for Watchers came to me, and it was irresistible, the idea of a dog that comes out of a laboratory of enhanced intelligence experiments. Watchers is the story of Travis Cornell, a former Delta Force operator who struggles with the meaning of his life. While out exploring a canyon near his home, he encounters two genetically engineered creatures that have escaped from a top-secret government laboratory. One is a magnificent golden retriever of astonishing intelligence. The other is a hybrid monster with a brutally violent nature. It was a very emotional book, which I think is one of the reasons it's done so well over the years. Uh, I think we're past 14 million copies of that book of sold worldwide, uh, and it never goes out of print. Uh, and it was a joy to write. I, I heard so much feedback from dog owners that I had gotten the dog in watchers. So right, uh, but that of course motivates you to want to write about dogs some more because you want to. Uh, if readers said, "Hey, you did that really well," you think, "Oh, good, then maybe I'll try that again." Watchers established Dean Koontz as a best-selling author and one who would go on to prominently feature dogs in other books. One book in particular impacted his personal life as well as his professional life. It was not a long time after that, uh, just a couple of few books later, that I I wrote a book called Midnight. And this is how it's, this is how the dog thing moved in my professional life and also personal life. I was looking for something unusual with a character 
And I read this article about Canine Companions for Independence. And I thought, oh, that will increase suspense a lot if there's a secondary character and story thread. This town that's under siege, there's a man in a wheelchair that you come to like, and he's got this assistance dog. And that ups the tension in that storyline. And after that book I published, it was the first book I read, written that went to number one. And the people at Canine Companions came and said, hey, uh, we love seeing our name in the book. When the paperback comes out, would you put our address and a little bit about us in it? So I said, sure. And they invited us to come down there and see them. And, and we did. And we were absolutely captivated. Canine Companions for Independence, or CCI, has been providing service dogs to individuals with disabilities at no cost since 1975. Dean has supported the organization since the early 1990s after the release of Midnight. Dean and his wife, Jerda, adopted a Canine Companions release dog named Trixie, a golden retriever. And everything I thought I knew about dogs, I did know. But there was so much I didn't know until one was sharing our life. And they became as magical as I already thought dogs were. They were far more magical than I ever realized. Uh, Trixie was actually in service as an assistance dog to a young lady who lost both legs in a traffic accident. Then Trixie developed an elbow problem and had to be taken out of service and came to live with us. Dean is the first to admit that he and his wife are workaholics. It's what prevented them from bringing a dog into their lives sooner. But dogs have a way of transforming our lives for the better. And Trixie soon made it known that working late would not be tolerated. When Trixie came to live with us, I worked. I'd start in the morning and I'd work till 7 o'clock at night. And we'd have dinner. Jerda would be busy running the business and the She worked the same hours. Uh, Trixie wasn't there a couple few days a week, less than a week. And at 5 o'clock, because... I think, you know, dogs have a clock in their head. It's bizarre, but they know when it's feeding time and they know they love their routine. And so at five o'clock, she would come around the edge of my desk and look at me as I'm sitting there typing. And she'd stare at me and, it, and they can give you a pretty meaningful stare. Yeah. And I would look at her and smile and say, oh, you're so cute. And uh, after about two days of that, when she saw a staring wasn't working, uh, she she came over and I was working on the keyboard. She put her head under my arm and threw my hand off the keyboard and she kept it up. So I stopped that night. The next night, five o'clock, she came up, didn't even wait, came up, boom, threw my hand up. And after several days of this, I said, okay, she's telling me I need more time than you're giving me. That was the end of working till seven o'clock. Living with a dog with Trixie gave Dean new perspective. Dog walks became moments of wonder as he began to see the world as Trixie did. He noticed flowers that she lingered near and plants that she showed an interest in. All of these things he would have strolled by without noticing before Trixie. He began to explore more of that human-dog bond in his work. So I frequently include dogs, sometimes as one of the major characters, sometimes as a supporting role. Uh, I just had a book out last year, Devoted, in which I visit the idea of the human-dog bond and say it is so mysterious and has been going on for so many thousands of years that there is a possibility one day it will evolve into something more wondrous than we can ever imagine. Trixie and Dean shared a deep connection. Trixie even appears as co-author of some of his books. After her death, Dean brought home Anna. And when she passed, Canine Companions reached out once again to Dean and Jerda. The people from CCI came up for a lunch and, uh, and we were sitting talking and they said, we know you're, what you're like and it's going to be months yet till you can take another dog, but uh, we do have one that needs a home if you know anybody. And 
she held up her phone with the picture of Elsa on it, and Shirley and I just both burst into tears and said, we'll take her. And, you know, I think the first time you think it's like a betrayal of the dog you lost. And of course it isn't, but that's what's kind of in your mind. But his experience with Trixie was most formative. I, there is something mystical about that relationship, how profoundly it changed me and how much beauty it brought into our lives. He captured that beauty in his memoir, A Big Little Life. It is a loving portrait of life with Trixie and her greatest gifts, her intelligence, her joy, and her uncanny knack for living in the moment. And it really comes down to this, our relationship with dogs, your relationship with a good dog. There's even any human relationship, no matter how wonderful it is and how loving it is, has its ups and downs. It has its moments of contention and disagreement. With a good dog, there isn't any of that. With a good dog, it's just this kind of pure, wonderful, happy relationship that goes on far too short. And that is a kind of miraculous thing. That was um, that was such a beautiful interview. I had absolutely no idea that this, you know, enormous best-selling author had such a connection to dogs. What was it like to meet him? Oh, he was awesome. He was gracious, and obviously, we did this via video technology, and I got to meet his dog Elsa, who was uh, dutifully by his side throughout the interview, kept nudging him, you know, trying to get a little belly scratch and a little chin rub, and uh, in the process. Dean had uh, dog fur that he had to occasionally remove from his mouth because, you know, he was just fur-tied. Fur-tied. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Back to the puns. I get it. Um, oh, and I just want to point out that if you're anything like me and you like your suspense in smaller doses, season two of his short story series, Nameless, is out from Amazon Original Stories. Season one was so good. Uh, oh, and it's free for Amazon Prime members. So there's that. And if you want to hear more from Dean Koontz, uh, you can hear the entire conversation on another Dog Podcast Network show, The Long Leash. That's coming out soon, right? That is coming out this week. You can hear the extended conversation and uh, get to hear things from Dean that I don't think he has shared anywhere else. Well, that story in itself just left me wanting more, so I'll be tuning in. We're going to take a break, but we'll be right back. You're listening to Dog Edition. Hi, it's me again, James Jacobson, and there are three things that you should know about me. One, since 2003, I have been driven by an all-consuming mission. That mission is to help improve the quality of life for dogs and the people who love them. Two, I have founded or helped to co-found several companies that share that mission, including Dog Podcast Network. And three, every day, I give my dogs Everpup the ultimate daily dog supplement made by Functional Nutriments, which is one of those companies. What is Everpup? Everpup is an extraordinary all-in-one supplement that you sprinkle on your dog's food. It's a polyceutical, which means it contains an incredible blend of lots of different human-grade ingredients. It contains vitamins and minerals and prebiotics and probiotics and enzymes and dietary apoptogens and so much more. What you need to know is that it supports every cell and system in your dog's body. And Everpup is appropriate no matter what type of diet you feed your dog, from kibble to raw food to home cooked. And the rich green powder is easy to add to food. Dogs love the taste, they find it delicious. And you can even try it yourself because Everpup is made with 100% human grade ingredients. It's made here in the USA in an FDA-registered and inspected laboratory. And all the ingredients are ethically sourced and triple-checked for quality. Seeing is believing, so try Everpup for a month and see what happens with your dog. Everpup is available through select veterinarians and pet shops and Amazon, but here is the best way to try Everpup. Join the Everpup Club and get free shipping to any U.S. address. As a listener to this podcast, you can get your first shipment of Everpup for just $8, including free shipping when you use the discount code DOGEDITION. For all the details, go to everpupclub.com and try your first full jar of Everpup for just $8. That's everpupclub.com. 
Welcome back to Dog Edition. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to ravish communities and countries worldwide, it's possible that some very special dogs and their sensitive snouts could become the first line of defense against the virus. That's because across the globe, dogs are being trained to sniff out COVID-19 using their incredible sense of smell. Already, some dogs are being used in public places in France and also at airports in the United Arab Emirates, but the aim is that they become commonplace in detecting the virus across the globe. We wanted to know just what it takes to make a COVID sniffer dog and how the science behind it all works, so Caro went along for a training session with some talented pooches in Australia to find out. Here in this busy airport, there's a real buzz, while passengers and planes come and go. People are milling around while announcements blare over the loudspeaker, and among the travellers with their bags lined up at security, there are dogs, COVID sniffer dogs to be exact. Yes, good boy! <laughs> so, because we've been playing lots of tricks on these dogs, he has to learn to use his nose, and this is what we want to do. We want him to solve the problem using his nose. But this isn't really an airport. It's a hallway at Adelaide University where South Australian firefighter and dog trainer Alex Withers is putting some Labradors through their paces in sniffing out the deadly coronavirus. So what we've got is we've got two people here that we've planted our training odour on. All right, so we've got our first dog. This is Stanny Boy. Yes! Nice work, Stanny! Good boy! So that was a nice, nice, clean uh, condition response, and that's what we're looking for. We don't want the dogs to be active around the people. After running down the line of volunteer airline passengers, two-year-old Stan sits confidently and stares at a young girl with a backpack. That's his cue that he can smell COVID-19. And so the happy-go-lucky Black Lab is rewarded with pats and treats for a job well done. I guess the buzz from training a dog and watching those lessons come together and seeing the dog make a success is you, can, you just can't beat it. What can I say? It, it, it really makes your day. Stan is one of 15 Australian Border Force detector dogs that have spent the past few months learning to recognise a very distinct odour from the underarm sweat samples of COVID positive patients. While the researchers aren't sure exactly what volatile organic compound or compounds the dogs can smell, the 300 million olfactory receptors in their noses are proving invaluable. I think they are going to be an incredible tool. Um, I'm just thinking in any countries where they actually lack um, laboratories or they cannot test people in a, in a very rapid way, um, it could be a major help. Dr Annalise Chabert from Adelaide University's School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences is leading the Australian arm of an international alliance in training COVID sniffer dogs. We are actually um, part of a big collaboration of 15 countries now and we are all sharing data and resources. That collab includes France, the United Arab Emirates, Canada, Chile, Belgium and the UK among others, while other countries like the US are doing their own trials. I wanted to, um, to try to help finding uh, a screening tool for COVID that was fast and reliable. Well done. And so far, that's been the case. It was an excellent result. He transitioned beautifully and his alert was nice. Not only do sniffer dogs work faster and are cheaper than using PCR tests, that's those saliva swabs we're all familiar with, but the trials have found the dogs can detect COVID-19 before a positive reading shows up and before someone shows symptoms. What we should see is that we have to do a lot of tests in, um, in series or in parallels and a dog is a very good tool, is much better than the antigenic uh, tests or saliva tests that are currently uh, being used in some countries. So I don't think it's better than PCR, I think it's a good complementary tool with, P as, uh, with PCR and what is very good is that the dog can detect people in incubation and that's true that no other test can do that. The idea being the dogs and the saliva tests will work in tandem to accurately detect the virus.
Just how the dogs will be deployed will depend on each country's needs. In places where there are large outbreaks, like France for example, they're being taken to crowded public spaces to sniff out COVID carriers, while the United Arab Emirates has the dogs screening airline passengers on arrival. That's Australia's plan too, and exactly why this stunt airport has been created as a training ground. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to simulate people standing in a queue, waiting for passport control and what have you. Training sniffer dogs to pick out COVID-19 follows the same principle as other odours. And as Alex Withers explains, it's about getting them used to a particular smell before you start adding layers of complexity. It could be anything. It could be explosives or uh, drugs would be common ones or it could be fruit for biosecurity. Um, and we then got the dogs to do the same principle, pick that particular odour in a lineup of cones, and then we increased the difficulty of, of that searching. So the number of cones, and we'd also add distractors in there, other smells, um, also blank runs where there was nothing to find. So in reality, there's a lot of runs where, or searches where you find nothing. So the dogs have to be used to that. Keeping across the ever-changing science and variants has been a challenge, but the dogs are up to the task. And to understand how good and useful the tests actually are, researchers are measuring two things, sensitivity and specificity. So our dogs are 96.5% sensitive and 98.1% specific. So sensitive is that um, when someone is uh, infected, is a um, percentage of uh, time that the dog is actually really going to pick this person, saying, yes, this person is diseased. And specific is when the person is not affected, the dog is going to say, no, he's not affected. So he's giving the right answer. So yeah, that's very good result, but that is in control settings. While results will vary in the real world and there are more trials to go, Annalise Chabert is excited about what this will mean not just for detecting COVID but other viruses in the future. It means that uh, we can have a new tool to actually screen people. And we are speaking about COVID, but it could be other diseases. We know that animals and dogs have been used for other diseases, not in operational settings, but we know it's, it's feasible. So I think it's going to um, allow us to have another tool to screen a lot of people in a very short period of time. And that's what we need, because we've, we've got many humans on the planet, and um, I don't think that's going to be the last pandemic. Something that looked impossible at the start for this team is now becoming a reality. And all agree it's about them doing their little bit for the greater good. Well, it's been an honour actually um, to be able to uh, use some of the skills that I've been lucky enough to, to have. And yeah, I'm honoured that I'm part of the project and very humbled that we can maybe play our little part uh, here in Australia. Well, I, I love this story. And especially, you know, I have a daughter who's at Boston University, and they've been able to keep students on campus because they test them every two to three days with the swabs in the yeah. nose. And imagine if they had, you know, just a bunch of dogs running around campus <laughs> sniffing out COVID. I think it would be wonderful. <laughs> Way less painful, a lot more fun. And uh, that would be a great thing. You think? Are the, you think we can start seeing that? I hope so. They bring dogs on campus during finals to relax, you know, relax students. I think a little double duty maybe for some of these dogs, that would be great. Why not? Great application for that incredible nose that dogs are gifted with. Yeah, 300 million olfactory sensors. I can't even imagine, but they managed to really hone in and smell exactly the compound that uh, scientists have been looking for. So, um, you know, yay to that, I say. Less swabs, more dogs. <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, let's head over to the hydrant for a chat about some of the hound headlines that we have come across this week. What did you see this week, Pam? So I was scrolling through some news stories and something caught my eye because it took me right back to my wedding day. I just celebrated my 23rd wedding anniversary and my wedding gown was designed by Batchley Mishka, who's known for these very elaborate and beautiful um, beaded dresses, uh, is actually now designing 
a line for dogs, so, <laughs> which is so thrilling to me. So it started with this floral dress that they designed and a matching dress for, for dogs. And now, of course, they're going to extend into all, all sorts of, of dog products. And, uh, and they're very fancy. Very shishi dog fashion. I love it. Yes. Not, not just a yeah. little like vest, but like a fat. How much are these going to cost? Well, you know, I I dug into that a little bit, and the the first design that they released was a, a harness for dogs, and the harness was being sold for one hundred and seventy five dollars. But but all of the all of the proceeds from those purchases were being donated to North Shore Animal League. So you know, that's that's a nice very thing. nice. So canine couture with you know a heart. <laughs> yes, exactly. All for a good cause. What are you seeing, Caro? Well, my find this week is about sensory gardens. So that's those specially created gardens uh, that, you know, you can experience through the five senses, touch, sight, scent, taste, and of course, hearing. Now, I hadn't thought about creating one of these for dogs, um, but Hmm. in Australia, in the state of New South Wales, they've created five unique gardens at, you ready? Grey's Land, which is a greyhound rescue, rehab and rehoming centre. And we know greyhounds who have been in the racing industry have little experience really out in the outside world. You know, their life is all about training and racing and, and lots of hours left on their own. Um, so when they arrive somewhere like Grey's Land, they experience human kindness often for the first time and, and to try and uh, bring in, you know, that positive reinforcement before they're rehomed. This, uh, this, uh, rehoming centre has decided that these gardens um, are going to help with that. So there's three sensory gardens, one training garden and one buddy garden. I'm not quite sure what that is, but I'm guessing that it's where you, I don't know, hang out and have a pooch beer with your with your buddy. Um, but yeah, but it's using, you know, objects and plants and other and surfaces that will stimulate all the senses. I love it, and and dogs are re- and we and dogs are so good at using more senses in more ways than we do in an average day, and so that's great. I need to visit Grazeland. That sounds great. Grazeland. <laughs> we need to send you there. I wonder if they're piping Elvis music just you know through the <laughs> through nice. the speakers. I don't know. I'm a hound dog. Oh, uh, what's, what's the Elvis song? Oh, um, yeah, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Well, I have been drawn to an eight-year-old boy in Lebanon, Virginia. His name is Bryson Kleiman, I think. And he had, throughout his young years, collected a pretty impressive Pokemon card collection. However, he decided that he had to sell it because his dog was diagnosed with Parvo. And they had some big vet bills, so he set up a a little stand to sell his Pokemon cards so he could raise funds for the Parvo treatment. And, of course, it got on social media, and lots of people contributed money and services to help cover the vet bills. And it's a happy ending. He got to keep his Pokemon card, got some new ones, Mm -hmm. and the dog got the attention it needed. That's a wonderful story. That is, and that is a big, big deal for a oh young gosh. kid to give up their Pokemon mm-hmm. cards that easily. I, I know from uh, from experience and from all the little kids on my my block that they they don't let go of those easily. <laughs> so good. For He's him. such a cute kid. We will put a link in the show notes because you have to see him set up uh, on his yard with his box of Pokemon cards uh, that he's about to sell, um, but. It's pretty amazing. It's a touching story, and we have links in the show notes. Well, that's all that we have for you today. Thanks for bringing Dog Edition along with you on your walk today. Chances are that before our next episode, you and your dog will be taking a walk, and we have something else for you to listen to. If you're interested in hearing more from some of our guests, you can check out DPN's sister show, The Long Leash, for Jim's extended conversations. This week, you can hear my extended conversation with Dean Kuntz and uh, learn some things that you may not know about Dean and what a massive dog lover he is. That's on the long leash. And follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app so you can take us along on your dog walk next time. Next episode, we dig deep into one of the largest dog health studies in the U.S. and it's all about golden retrievers. 
And we celebrate Pride Month with a story about the role of support dogs in the LGBTQ plus community. Until then, head along to dogedition.com where you can leave us a voicemail and share your stories with us. Just click on that little button that you'll find at the bottom right of every episode page. And check the show notes for links and information about the guests on this and all of our other episodes. Also, we are looking for correspondence as we grow this podcast and Dog Podcast Network. And so if you are a content producer or a journalist or a podcaster or an audio storyteller, perhaps a dog writer, <coughs> Dean, who loves dogs, check out our 101 Dog Stories contest with over $15,000 in prize money. And join our pack. Be sure to follow Dog Edition in your favorite podcast app and tell a friend about the show. I'm Pamela Lawrence, and I'll see you at the dog park. I'm Caroline Winter, your resident news hound. And I'm James Jacobson. Thanks for listening today. And on behalf of all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, we wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. <laughs>